Marxist theory, unorthodox Marxist theory, has ever given. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, from the unorthodox Marxist position in the West, we all know, okay, uh, Second International, uh, Soviet Union, uh, Leninism, and so on, that made one current of the Marxism a dominant current, so to say, in the, uh, especially after the, the Russian Revolution, but even before that. And these people like uh, thought about Marxist Marx writings and Marx uh, philosophy as uh, of an ideology, more or less. So they engaged in exegesis of the Marxist writings on political economy, on capital, and mostly they were a very narrow, hard line, never said that Marx, Marx was wrong, even if he was wrong. Uh, this orthodox position never allowed for it. So actually, it developed in a, in a direction of an orthodox quasi-religion. Um, contrary to that, in Austria and in Holland even, and in, in Germany, there was another current with these young people. Uh, all was started by Karl Kautsky, who was a gener generation elder than the most Austro-Marxists. They were around uh, 18, 19 born or something. 1880-something. So Karl Kraus actually organized all these young people with an idea to critically engage with Marx's writings, not to just exegesis that and, uh, and uh, write laudatio about Marx, but to critically engage with Marxism. So uh, they knew that uh, from the time as, as Marx died, a lot of things had changed. Uh, what has changed? Marx was writing in the times of the industrialism, high industrialization, and so on. But in the meantime, we had something that was called the first globalization. This globalization that we have now, starting from the early 90s, is not the first one. The first wave of globalization started in what we know as Belle Epoque, end of the 19th century. This was the, let's say, the huge advance in the communication technology telegraph. Uh, people were suddenly able to, to telegraph uh, news in, 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 a, in a minutes over the oceans. And that, of course, gave rise uh, to financial markets, to what we know now. Speculation, financial mar markets, uh, small-scale mercantilist uh, industries have turned to be uh, huge multinational companies. And for example, uh, as uh, John Maynard Keynes, one of the leading economists of the 20th century said, he, he himself uh, lived in this time of the first globalization, which ended with the first world war. He said, this was the time when I was sitting in London uh, in my house and uh, my servant brought me a New York Times that was uh, published two hours ago republished in London, where I could, uh, on my uh, uh, telefax, uh, speculate on the New York bourse. All that things Marx did not foresee, could not, because the technological revolution that came after the death of Marx made all that possible and changed the entire political economy and the entire uh, technology and what is possible to make out of economy uh, in, at the end of the 19th century. And this exactly was what Austro-Marxists engaged themselves with, with these changes and how. So they did not see Marxism as a ready-made uh, instruction sheet of how to do something. They saw that as methodology as only as methodology, as methodology that uh, researches, that sees the world, that makes theory on behalf of historical uh, science, uh, concrete historical situation. So they were actually empiricists. They, they, they uh, for example, they contended back then with a very famous uh, school. There were in Vienna two actually famous schools of economy. One was the Austrian School of National Economy with Mises, uh, Bawerk, uh, later Hayek, and so on. These people are the fathers of our today's neoliberalism, and uh, these people, let's say, 
uh, found their place in the history and are very cherished uh, even now. But there were another school of economists in Vienna, and this were Austro-Marxists. So Austro-Marxists uh, did not have problem to, to engage in very uh, deep debates also with the Austrian school of economy on what is economy, how does it function, and how should be researched. For example, the entire liberal economy and liberal political science, and we know it from today, for example, is based on the abstract concepts. So, for example, uh, rational choice theory, very popular theory nowadays. Uh, rational choice theory, what does it say? Okay, how do they research? What is the method? They imagine an abstract individual, an abstract individual endowed with right information, right knowledge, and they contend that this abstract individual in the case that it has the right information on time and so on, will choose the most rational economic option. Does this individual live anywhere? No. This is an abstract construct. So they say that this individual is the basis of their theory. But this individual does not exist. In which time does they live? I mean, how can we prove that there is such a rational individual? Where is it? Nowhere to find. So this is the difference between abstract concepts, philosophical abstract concepts, and real historical situations with real actors who have their names, who live in a certain time, and whose actions can be critically proved, proven, mathematically, uh, statistically, and so on. And this is what Austro-Marxism said. We refuse to build our economic theory our state theory, whatever theory, on some abstract concepts that are actually useless. They said they are useless because they cannot either be proven nor disproved. So, and this is something that, that was absolutely new with the Austro-Marxism, that they use Marxism as a method, as a historical method of concrete actors. So when they build their economic theory, where they build their state theory, political theory, they look at a group of people in a certain time, surrounded with a, with a certain technology, a state of art, uh, concrete problems, and research on them. So this can be then proven statistically, mathematically, and so on. Abstract concept cannot be proven, nor is approved. And this is something what is actually, the, for, for my opinion, the, the, the most valuable of the toolkits that they, that they uh, give us further to, 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 to research. So what, this, uh, what does it mean in concrete? For example, uh, let's say uh, first globalization. We had the new financial markets. Marx did not write anything about financial, global financial markets because there were none as he lived. Uh, that's why, let's say, one of the Austro-Marxists, uh, Rudolf Hilferding, wrote at that time uh, the book called The Financial Capital. So he actually tried to engage this Marxian method of here and now and concrete actors to prove how economy, how global economy now, now global economy, because we had the first, first globalization, how does it function? And what does it mean for distribution, for the labor, uh, for the state, for the transformation of the state, for the transformation of the markets, for the supply chains, and so on. And it was Hitherto, actually, the first book engaging with financial markets from this perspective. Uh, Hilferding, for example, was uh, two times uh, minister of finance in the Weimar Republic. Uh, so he also, so he did not write out of abstract concepts. He was deeply engaged in politics. He made decisions. And this is something, for example, which is the difference between, uh, we all know like unorthodox Marxism in the West, the central figure of that is Antonio Gramsci. But Antonio Gramsci was very good and everything. But it was one man sitting in a prison. And he did what he could as one man sitting in a prison. 
but these were at least 20 people sitting in the positions of power at the times. They were able to, to change and to test their theories in reality. And if they worked, to see how they worked, and if they failed to work, to engage with the question, why? Why did it fail? So for example, as they came to power, uh, Austro Marxist, uh, the Socialist Workers' Socialist Party of Austria, came to power in 1919. Uh, but their uh, position of power was in Vienna. And at that time, Vienna was, a, let's say, red island in a big, uh, dark, uh, black sea of the People's Party, uh, Conservative Party. So uh, they were in the position to see how and what it means to be in power, to be responsible, but not in absolute power. And this, this was uh, the problem that we also have now. Nobody has absolute power. It is, if somebody has absolute power, then we uh, call this dictatorship or uh, authoritarianism or, or populism or whatever. So this is always, let's say, this uh, balance of power that leftist organizations have to meet and have, this is a challenge that we still have more than then. So they were in a situation to be in the government, but not with an absolute power. So, and of course, the adversary did not want to, absolutely no change to, to economic or uh, political or social uh, politics in Vienna. So, but they had, and what was very important, how could they manage to change anything? Because they had a very strong workers' organization behind them, and it was the end of the First World War. First World War, and this is very important, that Austria lost. And this is very important. For example, in Italy, in the same situation, Italy has also a very strong workers' unions and so on, but Italy, unfortunately, won. And with this win, Italy had, uh, in Italy, the nationalism, this national sentiment of, of glory, of, of uh, victory, has actually gained momentum that, uh, that endangered the chances of any uh, social transformation. And as we know, sooner or later produced uh, Mussolini and fascism. Austria did not have this moment of victory. Austria at 1919 uh, stands in the position that actually Austria was not even sure to, 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 to rule over its own territory. It is, uh, it is a very, there's a very hard discussions with Antanta and these discussions about is Austria is going to be a state, uh, sovereign state or not. These discussions were led by the Austro-Marxist in Paris. So uh, actually we can thank to Austro-Marxists that Austria exists as a state. Because it was not given. In 1919, after the First World War, actually from one side this was the idea that Austria should be a part of Germany. That Austria cannot survive so small. Uh, Hungary wanted Burgenland, the only possible place for Austria where it could grow its food. Uh, Tyrol and other... Uh, uh, places did not want to, let's say, finance Vienna, and so on. Uh, Italy, at Italy, of course, Italy took uh, what it could from Austria. So Austria's existence in 1990 was far from safe. No. Uh, so these were also the people. So Austro-Marxist uh, Karl Renner, for example, was the guy who was sent to Paris to discuss if and how Austria should be. Uh, so that said, Austro-Marxists engaged in real-world politics. So the theories they made were made out of experience and out of failures and out of, 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 of really a vast experience. So uh, Karl Renner uh, engaged in the, in the state theory, Otto Bauer also. Otto Bauer, for example, and I will say only things that matter now. Uh, Otto Bauer, as he was 25, wrote a book about nationalities and social uh, socialism. Uh, Otto Bauer wrote that book uh, against the background of the Austrian uh, uh, 
uh, empire who was composed by many nations and many nationalities and how to solve this problem. Could it be solved within a greater state or everybody should go and establish their own national state? These are the questions that unfortunately are uh, even now more than ever uh, still actually present among us, as we know. And Otto Bauer in the sixth chapter of this book writes a very interesting uh, thing. And he actually asks himself why. So why? in a certain periods of history, we have these big uh, plurinational states like Soviet Union, like Yugoslavia, like Czechoslovakia, like United States of America, like Austrian Empire. Why in the certain periods of time, uh, there is this urge, this impetus to build such kind of multinational states and why in another historical context, there is an urge to state that defragmentation, which we witnessed in the 90s, for example. Otto Bauer did not live to see that, but actually it proves his, uh, his very uh, interesting questions. And he said that in the moments where the political, geopolitical economy of the world, let's say in the times of, uh, first he, 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 he researched on the first globalization, the globalization of the Belle Epoque. And the globalization of Belle Epoque made like uh, global markets, global chains of supplies and so on. And he said these global chains of supplies and global markets uh, make uh, these big states, empire art of the states, I mean not empire, only empire as Austrian empire, but empire as United States one is, and, or, or Soviet Union or, or the blocks, interest blocks, this kind of empire, actually obsolete. Uh, and this urge to build empires comes actually from the times when the globalization, he said, came to an end. Uh, and in these times when the globalization comes to an end and the crisis appears, like now, for example, the crisis appears, global chain of supply didn't work and so on and so on. We have again this urge to build autarkic states and uh, Austrian, Austria, small as it's now, it cannot be autarkic state. You can be autarkic so that you don't need a trade international with whatsoever. You need a big state, like state with like Soviet Union, like United States of America, and so on. So he basically, his idea and his thesis was that the state building and the structure of the state depended on the global political economy. In the times of crisis, you need plurinational big states that could also work autarkic, as now, for example, Russia must be one. And in the time of when the globalization functions uh, without problems, then we have this time when these empires are no longer needed. And this, as we saw in the 90s, as the second wave of, this is now my theory, not out of ours. In the 90s, as the new wave of globalization uh, started, uh, we did not need these empires, so they disintegrated into nation states. Uh, so nation state is not, uh, Bauer said, nation state is a construct, as empire is one. It is all construct. There is nothing natural on nation state, uh, nothing more natural than on the empire. These are the constructs given by the political economy of the epoch by the needs of the global or uh, disrupted global uh, markets. Nothing else. So nothing uh, primordial uh, uh, idea we all share our blood together or culture. This is secondary, even if we do, but we don't. Uh, the primary, actually, according to Bauer, is the uh, economic situation of the globalized or unglobalized economy. And this is very interesting for today. I would recommend uh, the reading of that book. Uh, chapter six uh, deals with that. Uh, as I already said for, uh, for uh, Rudolf Hilferding, who was, uh, as I said, uh, also he was a uh, uh, Womo Universale of that time. He uh, was actually a, a doctor, a medicine and economist. And as I said, uh, he was um, 
He was a uh, minister of finance in the time of the great, uh, great inflation in Germany. So he really had to, to think about it, how and why inflation comes and how to fight inflation. Should we, uh, let's say, he did not know Keynes back then, Keynes came later. So, uh, and actually that's where Austro-Marxists uh, Hilferding made a mistake. Hilferding opposed, very, uh, very, very uh, heavily uh, opposed against the inflatory, let's say, inflatory way out of inflation, uh, the Keynesian deal. So that uh, the state uh, goes in credit with itself and finance the public work and so on and big construction works and blah, 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 whatever, so that the inflation could be stopped and the great recession could be stopped. Hilferding had one very important reason why he was afraid of inflatory financing of recovery. Um, and this was the, the great inflation in Germany that he witnessed. And he knew that if the inflatory, uh, let's say, credit-based recovery could bring with itself uh, great inflation. Uh, he also was worried that that would disapprove the Marxian theories of value, but it is another thing, not so relevant now. Uh, so he then actually saw in the 30s, late 30s, what Keynes did for, uh, for the United States of America, and he saw his mistake. He wrote also about it in the 1940, short before he was um, imprisoned and uh, killed by the Gestapo. So uh, what I want to say, these all people were, were deeply engaged in the politics of, in the politics and economy of this very, very turbulent time. And this time was as turbulent as our time. We have the same globalization, the same financial markets, we have the same rise of the, of the populist, let's say, authoritarian regimes. We have disruptions in the supply chain, and we have the problem how to finance, how to finance growth, how to finance redistribution, how to finance uh, housing, affordable housing. That's all the questions that we are now, and they had an answer to that. Normally, in the capitalism, uh, affordable housing uh, and everything, uh, social programs would be nowadays financed, and they are financed uh, from the budget, let's say from the credit. The state goes into the credit itself, the banks, and finance it. And it, of course, the result of it is budget deficit. Austro-Marxism did not do that that way. They financed all this housing that we see here through taxation, progressive taxation. There were taxation on luxury, taxation, but basically they taxed the rich to finance it. But of course, in order, uh, if you finance it through the credit, through the budget, uh, ex through the overextension of budget, all the society will pay for that. If you finance it through progressive taxation, only the rich will, of course, bear the most of the cost. So what? do the rich say about that? The rich, of course, say, no way. As, as Mises said, Mises said, for example, that Red Vienna and this progressive taxation, that it is a robbery, criminal, terrible. Of course, Mises said that because Mises was rich. So uh, how then we, Mises thought, of course, okay, if you want to give some, uh, build some affordable housing, go, let's say, overextend the state budget and somebody will pay it eventually or not. Um, so they financed it through progressive taxation and it is my opinion that we should learn. So how, but how was it possible? Because of course the, the, the opposition of the rich was, was huge. They didn't want to pay for that. Why should they? They don't want to pay for that now. Why should they? So uh, how to bring them to that. And the only reason, only reason that uh, austro marxist and the Social Democratic Party, Workers' Party of Austria, was able to tax the rich was because they had 
very strong and even armed uh, arm of the workers' movement. After the First World War, these very many of the war veterans that came back from the front were poor and were workers, of course, and they were armed and dangerous. So actually in this vacuum, uh, also with the, let's say it was the, the, yeah, the lesson of the history is that the rich rarely accept to finance social projects from their own money and taxation, that they will hardly accept uh, progressive taxation, uh, but they had to, because it was a particular time, uh, yeah, situation in time, where the workers' movement was armed and dangerous. So actually, they had fear. Uh, so that's uh, in the moment, but it only like, like took one year uh, as the opposition uh, of the rich, because this is, uh, the, the idea of austro marxist and the social uh, workers' social democratic party of Austria was not limited to social housing, to eight hours uh, shifts, to to uh, retirement schemes, to no, they wanted to socialize, or today maybe somebody will say nationalize. They wanted to socialize big industries that were previously in private hands. So they, and that's where they failed on the opposition of the rich, of course. Uh, socialization of, good idea, to socialize big industries and to leave small businesses in private hand. That is what uh, socialist Yugoslavia did after the Second World War. It was this combined system, yeah. So big industry socialized in the state hand, in the state, not only state, but uh, the society, and small business in private hand, mixed economy. Uh, in Austria, of course, it um, encountered um, refusal and opposition uh, by, the, by the conservatives. So the idea was to first nationalize the Bank Austria, Kreditanstalt, and Alpine first uh, industry. And that failed because they were, as I said, they had no absolute power. They could not decide by themselves. They had to have the majority. And this majority, they did not have in the entire Austria. They had the majority in Vienna, but not in Austria. So of course, with the lack of majority, the, the, the socialization of uh, Kreditanstalt did not work. Because Kreditanstalt, and this is now this globalized world, Kreditanstalt, it was not only Austrian money. In Kreditanstalt, this was a money of, uh, of different investors and different banks all around Europe and America. So you cannot social as a bank where investors are sitting uh, all over the world. They did not want it. They said that they would withdraw and make bank uh, Austria Kreditanstalt default if it should be nationalized. So it couldn't be nationalized. First, Alpine one of the biggest industries in Austria. Of course, that could be nationalized, but uh, the shareholders, as it still was in the private hands, decided to sell it to the foreign investor so that the socialization cannot be done. And these are the problems that are very, very uh, interesting for our time, because the same, we are, if we think about how to socialize big industries, how to socialize banks, we should look back and see how it failed in the 1920s, the same way it would fail now. Uh, these impossibilities the, the Austro-Marxists faced, these challenges they faced, we are facing the same, same challenges now. For example, then, uh, Geta Leichter, one of the, of the biggest uh, also uh, economists of, of Austro-Marxists, uh, she died in, uh, in a concentration camp in uh, 1942. She said that, uh, and there is a text that we are now translating into English and we'll publish in the Sage and High Market, uh, about the experiences of, sociali of Austrian socialization. This is the text where she actually gave us account uh, uh, to 
all these fail failures and said maybe actually it would have been necessary to first socialize the bank, Bank Austria Kreditanschalt, even if even if it would have defaulted uh, for the for the flight of the capital uh, international capital after that. She she after all that happened, she thought it was impossible to socialize the big industry without first socializing the source of money, the bank. First socializing the bank, then the big industries. So this was her, let's say, lesson learned from uh, all these failures. Uh, these are, uh, I, I'm giving you not a really structured introduction to all this. As I said at the beginning, I am uh, only focusing on the things that they did, that they wrote, that they dealt with, this, that are still interesting for our time. And this is the question of the state, of globalization, financial markets, uh, socialization and uh, redistribution in against the background actually of the global capitalism and that's what they did and that's what I think we have a lot to learn for our time thank you uh, yes you, you were first. Yes. Um, so I wanted to return to this question about uh, you were talking about their method and as well as the austro Marxist were not exegetical, but they tried to ask what changed from Marx's time. And you gave a, uh, a wonderful example of Keynes sitting on his chair reading the New York Times from a few hours ago. And something that hung in the background, and I know that the Austro-Marxists, at least some of them, two people that you mentioned fell on one side of this, was the question of the revisionist dispute and the, the reformism in, in the Second International, or at least the dispute on that. Yes. And the, you know, going to this question of technological change from Marx's time, I was thinking of some of the, the critics of people like Bernstein, but they also would have been critics of Hilferding in this case, um, who would say, yes, there has been technological change, but that change was driven by class struggle, and even the financial capital as well. You can think of Lenin's critique of Hilferding, meaning the growth of the workers' movement seems to have overcome problems that were there in Marx's time. They've even spread the socialization of finance capital around the world. The very strength of the unions putting money in banks and that money then reinvested in pension funds in Russia, et cetera, imperialism in that sense. And so their response to this would be like, actually, whereas you think you're being more empirical and concrete, you're actually being more abstract because you're abstracting from the process of history and saying what is true here and now. You're avoiding the question that actually links Marxist time, meaning things have changed, but change also presupposes continuity to even say change. And for them, that which has remained has been the question of the crisis of society, the way they would put it as the class struggle, the contradiction. And so in that sense, that development is not just new changes, but a contradictory development. And so I was wondering then how maybe perhaps you would respond to that, or maybe that's a wrong uh, reading of Hilferding and um, other members of the Austro-Marxists, because that would be mm -hmm. like Lenin's response to them, even though he thought they had some valuable things to say. Obviously, he quotes Rudolf Hilferding. Yeah, Hilferding said himself that uh, for the, uh, he of course made distinction uh, between the, the workers in the first, in the countries of accumulation of the capital and the periphery. Uh, wait, periphery of okay. the capital, let's say. Yeah. Uh, imperialism has a center and periphery. So, and he of course saw distinction in the position of the working class in the center and in the periphery. And he said, of course, uh, he, he acknowledged that, that uh, worker class, working class in the center, uh, it is a twofold. Uh, from the one side, they gain. From the other side, they lose in a, in a bigger picture. So he, he saw all that. It is not that, uh, that he, he didn't. And uh, uh, apropos abstraction, I think, I mean, uh, you cannot avoid abstraction in any kind of interpretation of the of the of the facts of the of the society. Even if you, if you let's say, uh, uh, engage in a historical method with concrete people, you see, okay, how many uh -huh, these earn so much and this. So you have statistics and everything. You cannot escape interpretation, and interpretation is always a kind of abstraction. But they, uh, the, the this is uh, abstraction a posteriori. So you have the facts, you have historical facts, you have numbers, you have 
concrete people who did that and that and that. And then you interpret and make theory out of that. So you can say abstraction. The problem of the liberal theory was that they, they, they uh, went off from the abstraction in the first place. They did not. Uh, Austro-Marxists did not have the abstraction as the first step. They had the abstraction as the fifth step. Uh, you, you, what? Um, my, it's a bit linked uh, to this question of methodology, 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 and um, maybe getting deeper. What's the specific Austrian about Austrian Marxism expect from like its location in time and place? Because uh, when you said like um, they took it like a method and was not just like repeating like dogmatic phrases, I was uh, thinking about uh, Georg Lukacs, um, what is orthodox Marxism? It's an article from 1919 where he exactly states this. He says for him, Marxism in itself is a method and even if every sentence of Marx would be wrong, the method still would have a worth. And so what distinguishes Austrian Marxism from from an approach which uh, Lukács um, formulates in this article. Yes, Lukács is one of those who said if even if it's totally proven wrong, the method is right. That's exactly the opposite of what Austrian Marxism said. Austrian Marxism said if all indicators shows that your theory is wrong, then it is wrong, and it sh should it must be. Altered, it must be changed, it must be criticized. Even if Marx itself said it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And, and this is the, the, the difference. Method means critical historical method, nothing more. You say, okay, you see what has happened, who were the actors, in which time, what is around, why did it happen, you interpret and you see, okay, uh, Austro-Marxism actually uh, um, relied a lot of, of statistics and mathematics. Very much. Not philosophical speculation, but really statistics and mathematics to see how, like very, very similar to the, to the contemporary uh, economic... Uh, Do you think statistics are abstract as well? I mean, obviously they have very definite models of hypothesis testing. And uh, yes, we can establish models. Models are abstractions. Uh, statistics facts. itself is not abstraction. Statistic is a tool. Model is abstraction. Uh, you, I, you were a third. I have a somewhat similar question to the ones before, but maybe it will be useful to rephrase it a little bit differently. Uh, and I wanted to ask about, you raised the question of how Marxism can like uh, react and uh, grasp the experience of, like how Marxism can relate to the experience of uh, the post-second industrial re revolution world. Like you said, Austro-Marxism had a way of uh, being scientific in the sense that you described, and uh, it needed to have political power to be like in touch with the experience of what, what are you doing there, uh, and be like uh, in world politics, basically. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about uh, like the different way in which Lenin reacted to the same crisis when he thought, okay, 1914, uh, the crisis of the Second International means that we have to not do, like, not go to the, the kind of neo Kantian informed, uh, like, science in the way it was understood uh, most dominantly at that time, but rather to say we need to rediscover the Hegelian dimension of Marxism to understand that crisis. I was just wondering what you thought about that contrast. I think Lenin was a great revolutionary who really understood his country. His country, he understood. He did not understand Western Europe so well. So he understood that his country was a rural country uh, and huge country, huge and rural that could be theoretically also autark, what Austrian empire could not be. Uh, and these were absolutely different positions. They were very, uh, the, 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 the workers' movement in Russia 
was uh, in the cradle by that time. Russia was mostly rural. It was uh, feudal, rural, and so on. The state structure, the size, that, that means the, the apparatus of the state was weak. So it was possible, like uh, nowadays, and uh, the, the, let's say the, 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 the empires of, the, of, the, of the Europe, of Western Europe, at the time, as Lenin made a revolution in Russia, Russia was, had really weak institutions, had weak uh, institutions of the state. So it was like a pyramid. You chop up, you chop up the, 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 the tip and everything crumbles. It was not so in Europe. In Europe, the, the, the state power was like more like the different columns, columns of, uh, of economy, of different interests, of uh, different political uh, interests. So you had many columns that uphold this capitalist uh, uh, capitalist system. So if you cut one column, there are five others who will hold it. In Russia, it was completely different. So it was, for Lenin, very rational even to think that revolution of kind of that he planned would succeed. The same kind of revolution would have not succeeded in Europe because of the difference in sustainable power of the capitalist state. Uh, so how did um, Austrian Marxists connect with their efforts in their particular situation with the problem of socialism? Because all these measures that you described, with taxation, etc., they were addressing challenges uh, for the purpose, perhaps, of saving capitalism or helping the bourgeoisie survive in the long term, saving capitalism of its most immediate threats. So how they were connecting this kind of experimentation and effort with socialism specifically? But it, this is socialism. They were no Bolsheviks. Bolshevik so thinks, okay, state capitalism, let's say. Uh, socialism thinks uh, that about a gradual change, and that, that is what Austro Marxists thought it would be. First, housing, taxation, and so on, then nationalization, uh, socialization of the big industries and banks, and then this way they would achieve socialism. They didn't want to chop off heads of bourgeois, they wanted to integrate them in the system, of course, not with the bourgeois uh, capitalist. I mean, this is, socialism is no communism and is no capitalism. It is something third, third way. So they were like no Bolsheviks, they were no communists. So socialist uh, uh, party of, uh, workers socialist party of Austria were no communists. At that time, you also have a Communist Party of Austria. Communist Party of Austria, in 1919, when the First Republic was proclaimed on the same day, actually attempted the revolution, burned half of Vienna. Yeah? This revolution failed. So, but it is, these were not the same, same people. Uh, yes, you want. Yeah, um, I, I went yesterday to the Vashplan to the exhibition of uh, Austro Marxism, more or less, and there was a war paper. It was about this, what you, you said la uh, at last, um, about the third way. And I was wondering, maybe you can distinguish a bit more about what is the revisionist way of Marxism and what is this third way, and between what is this third way? I mean, it seems like it. They explain it more or less like we have the reformist or revisionist way, you have the revolutionary way, and the third way of the Austrian Marxism lays between, maybe. Maybe I'm misunderstood or um, they are wrong, what they are. I would say these all are very old like uh, qualifications. The qualifications that are obsolete nowadays. So if you. Uh, to ask what is orthodoxy, you must ask who, who claims this is the way. So if you take a Bolshevik way as orthodoxy, and it would have become orthodoxy after they won the Russian Revolution. Before that, there were people who interpreted Marx in the way 
that Marx wanted a classless society, something like communism. Yeah? But it is an interpre interpretation of Marx afterwards, yeah? from Second International and so on. So these people thought they represent what Marx really wanted. If they did, I don't know. I mean, that, that was what they thought. So this orthodoxy was actually a construct of the people who thought they are in right about interpreting Marx, Marx said, blah, classless society, good. Then we have Bolsheviks after the revolution, of course, with the power that they have, economic, military, and so on. They now determine what is right, what Marx wanted, and what not. And they determine that they way, Bolshevik way of the revolution, of the dictator, dicta, dictatorship of the proletariat, and so on. This is the right way, that is what Marx wanted. Marx was dead, nobody asked him. I don't know if Marx really wanted dicta dictatorship of proletariat. He never said so. So, uh, dictatorship of proletariat, no, this is what Marx never said anything about dictatorship of proletariat. Marx spoke about classless society. And this is actually this future projection of Marx is the weakest and most vague of his entire opus. Marx was genius in uh, determining the state of art of his time. He saw, okay, capitalism here, and it works this way, and it will probably make uh, circles and so on. Marx wrote very scarcely about the future. It was utopia, what he wrote about future, how he sees that. Uh, and in very interestingly, after the Marx died, Everybody who came to power within the workers' movement uh, actually thought he would know what Marx wanted. That's what Marx wanted. It, it, it is actually the kind of how you make a religion. You have a prophet, and then after the prophet is dead, some people come to power and say, this is how prophet said it would be, and if you don't think so, you are heretics. So this, that way they call third way, these are the heretics, but who proclaimed them heretics? The orthodoxy, the people that had the power to proclaim somebody else as heretics. So if we talk about socialism, socialism, the, the difference between, let's say, abstract communism, uh, what Marx wrote, and Marx, as I said, wrote very little about it, not much. He spoke about classless society. And the classless society can be achieved through revolution and gradually. So some decided revolution. Austrian revolution obviously failed in one day, uh, led by communist party. Russian succeeded. So these are uh, these are all, uh, let's say, like uh, ideas, and we should. That is my opinion for the future. Just get rid of all this orthodoxy, Bolshevism, and find new concepts for a new time. Using the method that Marx and austro marxist and uh, leftist critical scientists left to us. But I don't think that we will come much further uh, by by rereading the Bolsheviks or uh, or Mensheviks or Bernstein, uh, you were first, yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you a bit about. Um, so I, I know you're representing an organization. And correct me if I get this wrong. It's Transform Europe. Uh, I uh, what I'm speaking now is not the stance of Transform Europe. Right. I am not representing them. I'm representing myself. Okay. I am the coordinator of the Austro-Marxist project. Okay. So I am working on translation of the books. Uh, I uh, look for the text that I think should be translated into English and introduced to an international audience. I organize conferences. And basically, my job is to, to, to draw attention to Austro-Marxism. But I do not represent, I mean. OK. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to answer just to orient my question. So what drew you to the Austro-Marxist in the first place? You know, what brought you to this um, to this realm of research and what spoke to you about um, the Austro-Marxist that um, 
was deserving of, um, or, or actually, let me reframe it, because I know you've already talked about how, you know, third chair presentation was how they relate to your present moment. So um, maybe it's more in how were you introduced to the left in a way that drew you um, to the, Austri you know, how, how did the Austrian Marxists speak to you um, in a way that, that made sense for your, um, for your understanding of how leftist politics um, succeeded and failed? Well, I was uh, I, I considered myself leftist uh, from uh, let's say always, but in uh, my scientific research, so that what I consider myself to be in a political sense, it is one, and my scientific research is something else. So I dealt a lot uh, with the state theory, with the state, with the theory of state and capitalism, and how these both phenomena in, interact historically and now. Uh, how the transformation of capitalism had made, uh, had uh, actually helped uh, or, or influenced the transformation of state. Uh, I dealt also a lot with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, history and present of the democracy of different concepts of democracy, because there is not only one. Now we have a dominant liberal democracy as a concept, but throughout history there were others too. And uh, let's say all this research, and uh, then I just, uh, I, I had different sources, uh, liberal sources, classical Marxism sources, Marx himself, but uh, everything. And I must say that uh, Austro-Marxism has been uh, fallen, has fallen in oblivion, completely, even in Austria. And then just, uh, it was by chance that I, that I read uh, some, some things and I, I was amazed, I was shocked that I actually found the, the fully elaborated research on what I have been researching yet for the last 20 years uh, in Austro Marxism, 100 years ago, and nobody knows about it. And that's what, what uh, actually, I was shocked. And then, then I, re I read it all, and then this idea came together with Transform to, 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 to make it uh, accessible to, to an international audience, because I think it is, it is extremely interesting. It has, we don't have, I mean, it is, it is not religion. This is exactly what Hauser Marx has said. That's what they wrote. It was, uh, it was the reaction on their time. But their times and our time are not so different. I mean, I think even that they, their time and our time are more similar than their time and the time of Marx. So that's why I think it is uh, it is worth to 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 be, yeah, to be uh, presented to to the people who who deal with the same problems uh, politically and scientifically. Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah. Now the colleague, yeah. Okay. Oh, I would just say as well, uh, well very quickly in class, because we've also talked with a Hilfiger game biographer, Bill Smalltown, or sometimes he goes by Bill mm -hmm. Smalltown. Um, he's been at some more time. But I wanted to return to, sort of later in your presentation, you were talking about the socialization of banks, mm -hmm. right, and capital flight. And you were also bringing up the communist attempt at a revolution mm -hmm. in 1919 in Austria. And also then what Lenin's strategy was, and it made me think of, well, wasn't Lenin's strategy a global revolution? In other words, in socializing banks in Russia or even factories and abrogating on their loans and the war contracts. In other words, they were actually doing something that internationally was criminal, which is why 22 nations invaded Russia. But that's because the goal then would have really been to start a revolution in Europe and in that sense actually raise the necessity in Germany, which is why there was a German uprising, but also in Austria, in France, in Italy, and I think back to Keo's earlier question about what's the role of the socialist parties there actually perhaps in kind of quelling uh, what should have been led, you know, or it could have been an opportunity. Yes, for they quelled it, right? you're right. Uh, Otto Bauer said, apropos to that, we just uh, came out of one war where mm -hmm. we lost like million people, million young people for nothing. And I am not uh, really... Uh, I do not want that the Communist Party leads us in another bloodshed where uh, another 100,000 or something like that will be dead and nothing will be achieved. He said he, he cannot be responsible for that. He does not support uh, 
again a bloodshed for which he know it would not succeed. That was his estimate that it would not succeed. It was his very good estimate because he, I mean, <laughs> because, uh, because it, it didn't happen. It did happen, but the uh, Austrian Workers' Party did not support it. It did happen. So the communists... Well, the communist revolution, it didn't happen. No. no I mean, it was no, attempted no. to, but it was, uh, it was uh, caked in blood. So, And, of course, I mean, uh, uh, Otto Bauer and uh, the leadership of the Social Socialist uh, Party did not want to, to engage themselves in that bloodshed which he deemed uh, actually uh, doomed. And uh, yeah, so he thought and he, he reflected about it uh, for many times in his life. Because I, I guess I bring that up because you're also talking about how Bolshevism became cognitized. Of course, you know, the party became Stalinized and then Russia became like Something that's somehow separate from other countries. It's a higher stage in a lot of the myths that we got. Yeah. Okay, involved. but at that time, 1990, they could not know it. But well, but I guess my point being that that was also part of the condition of the isolating of the revolution to just Russia. That also then promoted the dogmatization of Bolshevism and the Stalinization of the party. I mean, yeah. those conditions were not separate. So I guess I bring that up because on the one hand, maybe he made an estimate about what was possible there, but we could also say that that social democracy or socialism's uh, role in West Europe also is responsible for the rest of what happened then in the 20th century to some degree. In other words, there's also other things that end up happening. Well, that he knew that, them, you know? that in 1990, uh, nobody would help them. So they would be on their own with the arms and weaponry, what they have. And he estimated that it is a doomed cause, militarily, just militarily, no, not only him. He had, of course, the military advisors. It is not that uh, they said without help, military help from somewhere. From this other is nations. this is a doomed cause. From so other nations, yeah, yeah, but nobody. From the yeah, but nobody was really very akin to to indulge. Uh, well, I have a other question, but uh, maybe uh, with that is so from that estimation. Was it also um, correct act for the Social Democratic Party in Germany to quell the uh, communist uprising there? Ah, well, they also had this, these estimates. They are not alone. So if you, uh, you must understand they were defeated in the First World War. Defeated. Their armies were defeated. Yeah. So, and you have what you, nobody should forget, Antante. The, the victory, the victors of the First World War, heavily armed and victors, and they were against, absolutely against any communist uh, overthrow. If there would be a revolution in Germany, which was defeated once more, then England, France, and Italy would have intervened and crushed it in blood. So this is not only what would happen in Germany. No. The Antante, was also, uh, not also, Tante was definitely the power that actually ruled over the, the losers over the next 10 years. But, uh, but was it, well, in, in the end effect, the social democracy did that what they feared the intent would do. And by that, make this. They didn't fear, they knew it. It is not, you know, I'm, I fear, they knew it. It was, I mean, it, like but, you but know that should, it will be. But why did they see the necess necessity to uh, spill all this blood if they think they want to stop the bloodshed? Especially when we see like the development in history that we not even have like some bloodshed in revolutionary times. We it was not speculation. War. Antante made it very clear, very clear what would they would do if there would be some revolutions in Austria or Germany. There is, there is absolutely no question. But why World War II then? I don't know, uh, because they were run by capitalists who didn't like it. Please. I have another uh, question. I want to come back to the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the orthodoxy. Because I very much agree with you uh, when you said that there is really hardly any reason today for anyone to claim orthodoxy with respect to Marx and its 
it means relatively little what we or anyone thinks about what what was it that Marx wanted. But then I don't really understand why you feel the need to even claim that he never said something which you very clearly said, namely that the dictatorship of the proletariat is necessarily the form which of state between socialism and communism, which we could, why not say, well, he said that, but it doesn't mean anything. That does not mean necessarily what later on in practice it would be. See, uh, the problem is that we always look the history from the future. Mm -hmm. So, and interpret, then we know what was dictatorship of the proletariat in 1917, and we automatically have this uh, problem, like th this is, this is uh, normal, to project that what we know on something far further back in the past. Marx just said something. You know, something. He could have said, uh, not a dictatorship, but he could have said anything. He did not mean that what years, decades after him, Lenin would make. He did not mean that. So we should know what Marx knew, his time. He never knew Lenin. At his time, these people, anything, does not exist. He has utopia, he has ideas. These ideas he writes about, as I said, not very much about it. His bulk of his work was analysis of his time and, uh, and the, the, the laws of capitalist production at his time. The ideas that he had how the future could be are actually not elaborated at all. I mean, this is very badly elaborated. It is utopia. Uh, but what happened later, it is not utopia anymore, it is real system. But this real system, although it takes Marx's uh, theory to legitimize itself, that does not mean that Marx would have uh, supported it. He was dead. You find that to be a distortion, like the 19, whatever just happened, the of course, I mean, everything is distorted. I, I think this goes back to the question, which is that one can also judge the present based on history, which is kind of what you've also been doing with the Austrian Marx, as you said. So look, people have not attained to that level of an Otto Bauer or a Rudolf Hilferding. I, I agree, we don't have a Rudolf Hilferding today. It would be a much more interesting environment. Oh. <laughs> but that's kind of, my, but that's kind of my, my point there, meaning that actually we can say, what did it mean? What was the insight that he had? And going back to the earlier question about history, how is it something that appears to be irrelevant today? Actually, it might be how the historical process has actually made it seem opaque or unclear. Because that's really what was Lenin, you know, I guess somebody brought up Hegel on Monday night. Uh, you brought up Len Lenin and Hegel. I did. You did. Someone <laughs> on the left side of my ear brought it up. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, in other words, he was trying to recover Marx. In other words, you would have to recover Marx by transforming Marx under the changed conditions, which also meant the existence of a Marxist international. And so likewise, I guess I bring that up to say, like, you know, on the one hand, we can say it's not what Marx could have foreseen, but one could be true to actually how the problem was bequeathed in that time. I think that Lenin just legitimates his works, his uh, doings, his revolution, and uh, think how he saw it should go in Russia and internationally with, the Mar with Marx. He needed some, some legitimation. It is better to stand on the shoulders of a giant than to start uh, from the scratch. Right, I don't think there's anything wrong with legitimizing it. I mean, he legitimized what? <laughs> yeah, but, but what he did is he, not Marx. Sure. It's he. Uh, yes. we, we should uh, okay, finish in about five minutes. Later. Okay. So then the last question, and then we Great. we can go. Can I ask you then what you think about like the Kautskyan orthodoxy on which Lenin based his perspective about like the international character of the revolution, even though it might need to necessarily start in Russia, but it like the Kautskyan perspective of 1910, 1912. When he said the next, whatever the next war that will start will have to trigger revolution, probably it will start in Russia, but it will have to spread to Europe. What do you think about that and in relationship, especially to the question of the third wave that Austro Marxism was? Nothing, because it failed. 
I do not think about things that failed. That was wrong. That was obviously wrong. So I think about the things that were proven right in the perspective of the time. Not that that were proven wrong. I mean, dead end. Forget it. Uh, yes? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe it's not clear enough, like the last time, but um, when you say about proving, uh, you had this Vienna circle around this time, and in the exhibition, I have seen the, the name Otto Bauer, and I said, okay, Otto Bauer, he was part of the Vienna circle. No, no. Otto Bauer, Dr. Otto Neurath, yes. and um, Rudolf Kanat, and they had this positive. Approach. Yes, Otto Neurath was both in Vienna Circle and Austro Marxist. Yeah, and I thought about is there was a connection or a big influence of the um, Austro Marxists from the Vienna Circle or were they interconnected? Yeah, there were some people who were, let's say, with, with one foot in the one and the other with, and of course, there were interconnections, uh, especially about the positivist uh, uh, approach to, to social sciences. Thank you. Ah, that's, that's yours. No, no, this is just a uh, This is the, ah, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> you just wanted to, <laughs> to take it with me. <laughs> Ja, das freut mich, dass Austromarxismus endlich mal wieder spannend ist. Johannes, dein Handy liegt auf Ja. Danke dir. Danke.